Hi, everyone. I'm Shaheen from The Content Mix, and I'm excited to be here with Simon Blake, EMEA Marketing Director for Vertiv, a global provider of equipment and services for data centers. Thanks so much for joining us. Hey, great to be here, Shaheen. Thanks for inviting me. Great. So could you tell me a bit about your background and how you became an EMEA Marketing Director, how you got into marketing? Sure. Yeah, I'll try and be, I'll try and keep it brief. So um, I've, I've been in this role uh, for approximately 12 years with this company, Vertiv. And I've had a number of different roles within the organization from a marketing standpoint. Uh, but just before that, a little bit of background. I spent uh, 12 years in agency. So I joined a small agency in Ireland after I left college. And we it was a small promotions agency. We built it up and we were bought out by J. Walter Thompson Worldwide. They saw what we did. They liked what we did. They didn't have that offering in Ireland. So they bought us to buy the expertise. And... Um, then our, after the earnout, our managing director left. I stayed on as managing director for a couple of years. And at that stage, I, I felt I'd kind of you know, run my course in terms of what I could do in agency. So I also wanted to see what it was like on the client side before I got what I thought at that stage was too old. And coincided with a time in my life where myself and my wife wanted to live abroad. So I left the agency. We came to Germany. And I really had no idea where I was going to end up. I kind of figured I was probably going to end up back in agency uh, but after looking, I ended up in uh, an area where I had no real experience in terms of the market set, which was technology. So what we do in Vertiv is, as you say, we do infrastructure, critical infrastructure for data centers. So all the big hyperscalers, you know, the big social media networks, internet service providers or small organizations, we're the backbone to make sure that they're up and running all the time. So really interesting area. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting industry to be in. It's a fast-moving one. And it requires us to be really on our game from a content point of view to hit the right basis. I see. And so the, the company has offices all over the world. So what, why are you... How did you end up in the, in the German office? Uh, yeah, we're a global organization. And really, the, you know, the EMEA part of that organization is again scattered across the media, but because I was based in Germany, you know, it just so happened that this is where this role, the first role that I took, which was to head up a Marcoms unit for the EMEA side of the business was located. So that's why, that's why I'm here. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, it's um, a nice place to be. <laughs> awesome. The, the company is actually based in Ohio, where's I'm, where yeah. I'm from, coincidentally. Um, yeah. Well, can you just tell us about kind of like the scope of the business? Because I, I know we said it's global, but... Um, it's yeah. a really big company, right? And it's actually listed on the on the stock exchange now. That's right. Yeah, we're uh, about a four billion dollar company uh, just listed on the stock exchange. We were part of a uh, Emerson Electric. Uh, that's where we started from. We uh, Emerson sold us a few years ago. We went into private equity, and we were um, we've gone public. And we have a new executive chairman, David Cody, who comes from Honeywell, giving us some fantastic new experience in terms of how we can accelerate the growth of the business. But what we do essentially is if you talk about critical infrastructure for a data center, very simply, you have the building, which is a data center. Inside of you, have, you know, thousands and thousands of servers, which are processing data. Those servers need power protection. They need clean power. And they need what happens in a data center with hundreds and hundreds of servers is an enormous amount of heat. So you need to extract that heat. But that cost of extracting the heat is about 60% of the total cost of running a data center. So you, companies come to us because they don't want to spend tons of money extracting heat. They want companies who can do it effectively, efficiently, and also make sure that the power is stable so that the servers don't go down. So they keep availability, but they also don't hemorrhage money in the process doing it. So they come to us for reliability, and that's what we do. And we service every single type of conceivable business. Retailers... You know, as I say, the hyperscalers, so the big guys who have, you know, these football field size data centers, to telecommunications networks, to industrial networks, oil rigs, everywhere where there's IT, you need critical infrastructure to support it. So anywhere you have a house, you need a foundation. So anywhere there's IT, we're somewhere on beneath it to support it with the critical infrastructure. And so what's your day-to-day -day like as a MAM marketing director? What, what's your role? So day to day, um, I mean, my specific area of responsibility is within content strategy for EMEA. And that is, you know, I would say it's, we need to identify, first of all, the themes 
that our customers are interested in hearing in bit. That's the first thing. And there are quite a few of them across the board, whether it's efficiency, whether it's reliability, you know, whether it's how can I make sure that I don't get fired from my job because I'm not doing a good job in this area. And that's a real you know, issue for some people. So first of all, it's like finding out what the themes that they're interested in. Second thing is then there's loads of other competitors in our space who also understand what's going on. So if we all talk about the same thing, we're not coming with anything new. So we uh, try to identify what is the gap between what they know and what they need to know. So we identify that gap. And if we can do that, and you imagine it's like a canyon, the person's there, what they need to know is here. And our job is to roll out that wooden rope bridge from one side to the other and help them navigate across there in an engaging, in an entertaining way so that we, and also a suspense, keep them, keep a suspense so they want to get to the other side. And when they get to the other side, this is where this promised land of this information that they're looking for is. And that's really what the day-to-day role is. It's like, what do we want to say? How are we going to say it? Is it compelling? And then, you know, what is the distribution strategy to make sure that the right people are getting the right message? How do we then follow up with them after that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, this reminds me of uh, like Joe Polizzi from the Content Marketing Institute. He says that like the the content, your content niche is that cross section between, you know, is it like what your, um, yeah, kind of what your customers are interested in, what you're you're an expert on, and how you can, you know, find where you can really bring value to them. So, exactly. so what, yeah, so what has been your approach? Like, what is your niche when it comes to content? Well, uh, that's a good question <laughs> because there is no one in our area. There is no one niche. There are a few different niches, uh, as I alluded to, and we also have quite a, a very broad target audience of who we can talk to. So more and more, you know, content marketing is an an evolutionary process. You know, and and the more we do it, the more we get more refined to identifying. Hey, we want to talk to Joe, the facilities manager in facilities this side, or we want to talk to the CTO of large organizations. And then it's really saying, okay, what are the maybe the two or three campaigns that we can run this year and beyond, which identifies maybe two or three, maybe even just two niches within that to say, okay, let's have something meaningful to say about that niche. And for example, you know, one of the areas that we've started uh, this year, uh, very successfully in promoting is the whole idea of a skills gap in our industry. So if you look at our industry, which is essentially dominated by mechanical and electrical engineers who come in and do this job, 20 years ago, this was you know one of the few areas where they could go into, you know, large component manufacturing, working in facilities. Whereas now, if I'm a mechanical or electrical engineer, I can develop an app, I can go and work for Google, I can do lots of other things with my engineering expertise. So we see less people coming into our arena. And this is an issue because we need people with tribal knowledge who can pass it on to generation to generation to generation. And we see this is getting tighter and tighter. So this is an area we say, this is not directly related to selling any of our equipment. It has no benefit to anybody, but it identifies a need of people who work in these facilities to say, yeah, I see that. I'm having difficulty finding people to work with me. Or if I'm a channel partner, I say, I can't get people to work in my channel business. So we talk about these topics in a, I would say, a very impartial way to try and generate traction. You know, Generate traction with people so they start relating to the company and saying, these guys talk about something that means something to me. They're not trying to sell me something. They're not trying to make me buy a product but I'm identifying with them. And I really believe, you know, content marketing is a, it's a long-term game. It's like building a long-term value for the business through an engaged audience. And you can't do that in three, six, or nine months. It takes years. I mean, you know, the content, content marketing Institute, and you've seen the example of the furrow magazine from John Deere, 120 year old magazine, which, you know, I think they say in the, the whole life of it, they've mentioned the words John Deere maybe four or five times. It's all about you know 
building the trust and relationship with an audience to get them to come back to you over and over. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, and do you have some examples of, of particular types of content or strategies that have worked for you? We did well. You know, give you another example of taking taking what I was talking about and uh, bring it to uh, uh, at sort of the next level of engagement. Um, so we talk about you know we have some uh, podcasts talking about this topic about skills. Yeah, we also talk um, to some channel partners about it and we promote that. So you know, getting voices from other people, not just us talking about it, but also we've just created um, an online. A tool which is called Data Center Career Simulator. So we have worked to design what do we think the, the top six new job roles will be in this sector that don't exist at the moment. Okay, so what are they, and what skills will you need to be able to compete for one of those roles, and what is the training you might need to do now? So we have an interactive tool which gets you to come in, ask you a couple of questions about what are you doing. What's your role? What are your interests? How progressive are you towards changing technology? And then it it almost has like an artificial intelligence which creates your personalized job role for you based on what what we think is your going to be your future role. And also gives them a customized video as well of what that role might be. So really trying to bring the idea to life through engaging engaging methods as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and it's really, yeah, it's really interesting to take that approach, like to focus on careers when that's really a, a topic that's not directly related to what you sell at all. Yeah. Um, so I was curious, like at the, how much of, of the strategy is done at the European level uh, or at the global level? And also being a MAO marketing director, like what is your, what challenges do you face like working in the European market and how is, this, yeah. how is it different than other parts of the world? Yeah, it's, it's a good one. I would say, you know, we, we have definitely as an organization become much more global in our approach to everything in the last uh, sort of 24 months, marketing also. So we work very closely from a, you know, a geographical term to develop the overall, let's say the campaign strategy and narrative that will go across the business. So you will have people from APAC. Latin America, North America, and then EMEA feeding in as one group to decide what do we want to talk about? How are we going to do about it? And then it's a divide and conquer in terms of who would take the responsibility for maybe building that, which is great in a PowerPoint slide. But as you, to your point, what are the challenges of, of working in EMEA versus maybe in a, in a single language uh, territory? I think for me, the biggest challenge being a, a native English speaker is you often come up with concepts, wording, nuances that work fantastically well in English language and they just do not translate. You know, and, and that can be, you know, even down to, you know, headline copy and blogs, themes for campaigns that you have, you're, you're bringing in some sort of changing some expression from English to make it seem, you know, smart and clever and punchy. And it just does not translate into other languages. They just don't get it. So often you have a very impactful English language, you know, opener or, you know, hook, which maybe is just not quite as engaging in other languages. So I think that's that's possibly the... the I think maybe I don't see that. I think the, the team across the territory probably find that maybe one of the more frustrating aspects of it. Mm-hmm. And how do you how do you solve that? I don't know whether you do solve it. <laughs> I think you have to accept that if you're working in a multiple language, uh, if you're d- developing everything centrally, and that it needs to be delivered at a local level, there's always going to be one territory who maybe gets, uh, you know, gets the most effective version of it. And sometimes we, we see that in Germany as well, where I work with the German team and we come up with something. And it's, it's totally works in Germany and it just could not work anywhere else because it's a it's a localized expression of dealing with things. And, and I think also language, you know, I think English is quite a, English language countries are quite casual in the way they talk and present things. Mm-hmm. Certainly in uh, German, it's more, needs to be more professional, a little bit not quite as casual. Uh, so you need to be, conscious of that when you're when you're you know briefing agencies or third parties to to write things 
or to create things. So it needs to somewhere fit in the, in the middle. But I think the risk is that you don't want to make it so in the middle that it's vanilla. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, I was curious, like, how, how do you measure the success of your content? Yeah, I, again, I mean, I, if you want to measure, you'll always find a way to measure something, right? Uh, and you can always find a way to measure it positively as well. And I think, you know, the key way that we try and measure back to the business is, you know, through metrics. You know, and a lot of it is always going to be quantitative versus qualitative. And obviously, content marketing does require a qualitative measurement. You know, you can have as many mentions as you want, but what was the takeaway of those mentions? What was the effect of that? And that is a harder nut to crack. But from the quantitative side, I mean, I think one of the one of the initiatives that we started actually um, about a year and a half ago was we, we do a lot of our business through channel partners. So distri- we sell to a distributor, distributor sells to a reseller, reseller sells to end customer. And you really want to have a, a try and motivate and engage the resellers to recommend your product to their end customer. But we don't have necessarily the direct touch always to the reseller. So we decided instead of doing newsletters to our channel community, we said, let's change that approach and make it like the Feral magazine. You know, let's make this a publication which talks about the things that our channel partners care about. We can also help them be educated about in front of their customers because these channel partners are not $4 billion global conglomerates. They're small companies, so their access to information that we would have would not be as much. So we said, let's create a a publication that goes out quarterly, which talks about these things that are going to help them look smarter in front of their customers and help them sell, you know, make it easier for them, but not talk about products, not talk about solutions, not talk about our company. So not an inward looking thing, a completely outward looking thing. And we started that, we launched it and we were all excited about it. But the measurement of it was about the same as the newsletters we're doing. You know, the pickup rate opens, clicks. So a little bit deflating at the beginning. But as you then did the second iteration and then into the third, all of a sudden you start seeing, you know, the the needle starting to lift up. And that's why I say it takes time to to demonstrate the success of content marketing. But I think when you really understand what you need to do, and this is what we needed to do, it works. So, you know, measurement primarily through quantitative means. um, But my, my, my comment would be to the audience is don't expect it to happen in the first two quarters. It could be a year. So there needs to be a buy in at an executive level that this is a long term strategy. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And yeah, that's that's what you said at the beginning. And I think it's a really good point. You can't expect to have results overnight. And the fact that that you you typically don't means that it's something that not everyone is doing. Um, so it's kind of like a bet that you have to take, right? <laughs> and Absolutely. expect a long-term payoff, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, well, let's go into to your recommendations. Um, so I wanted to ask you about an app or a tool that you use in your job. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's just been such an explosion in things like uh, collaboration workflow tools. And it's like, I've never seen anyone or heard anyone saying, that was an incredible marketing campaign. They must have used an awesome workflow tool or process tool. I think there's so many tools out there. And I do sense that often organizations try and use them to compensate for the fact that they don't have good content. The process is brilliant, you know? And it's like it's like the ISO certification for making concrete life jackets. You can make a concrete life jacket and get an ISO certification for it, but it it's useless, right? The process is great, but the end result is useless. So I think there's a lot of apps and tools out there. I think the I think the one that I would call out, which is um, a free one, uh, there's an enterprise version as well, is Grammarly especially for writers, where it really gives you a, a very fast you know, return on how am I doing? How was this? Quick, small changes that you can make that really, uh, I think, make a, quite a sharp difference to the end product. Absolutely. It would be cool if they expanded into more languages. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> for me, all right. But um, 
Well, and then I just want to ask you about any marketing influencer that you'd recommend people follow. Yeah, um, I, you know, I, I had the um, the benefit of going to content marketing world uh, almost two years ago in, in Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've been to quite a few conferences, events, marketing over over my, my career. And I've got to say, none of them have none of them have stood out at all. This one was fantastic. I mean, the, the quality of people that they had speaking were it's not it's not peer to peer all the time. You have people who work in the film industry, you have people who work in television, media, startups that are nothing to do with marketing, and they're really giving their input on how to tell a story, how to be engaging, how to win people over. Behavioral science, not marketing. And the guy who really stood out for me, who, who blew, blew me away, was a, a guy called Andrew Davis, who runs a, a podcast called The Loyalty Loop. And uh, I, I thought this was the, certainly the, the sort of eureka moment for me in terms of somebody who really understood how to connect marketing with behavioral science and make a difference. So I, I would recommend, if, if any of the audience is not following, follow him. He's really, really good. Yeah, really good recommendation. And also a great recommendation for an industry event. So that also um, answers that question. And actually, I'm from Cleveland. I've, I've never actually been to that event. I've always wanted to, but I'm a huge follower of the Content Marketing Institute. And actually, that was kind of an inspiration for what we're doing with the content mix and and this podcast yeah. as well. Just kind of You'll have to go. You'll have to go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it would be really easy for me, actually. I, I need to do it. It's just the timings haven't worked out. Um, and actually, when I lived in Cleveland, it hadn't started yet because I moved to Europe 10 years ago. So, okay. You know, there's a really interesting story about why it's... Uh, there's a whole... Uh, Joe Polizzi wrote a book. I think it's called Making Town Business or Making Business Town. Or maybe it was Andrew Davis. And it talks about... It's Andrew Davis wrote the book. And it's all about the reason that Content Marketing Institute is in Cleveland. Hmm. So That's it's, it's interesting. An interesting yeah. yeah, I'll definitely check that out. I love to learn the history. Um, well, so we're about at the end of our interview. Just uh, if you have any closing thoughts or final advice. Yeah, I think, you know, w one of the areas where I think a lot of marketers who are not focusing on content marketing and focusing on, I would say, you know, old school marketing is they market a lot to their internal organization, the executives in the company and themselves. They view things in a mirror. And... They talk about themselves, their customers, uh, sorry, not their customers. They talk about everything but that. They talk about, you know, the products, their services, their company, and how great they are. And really, that's not what, you know, the customers are looking to hear about. They want to hear about themselves. And now that we have social media, there are, you know, a thousand new ways that they can bombard people with the same message that they don't want to hear. And I think there's a real opportunity for people to, you know, look at what their competitors are doing and what they're doing and seeing, is there any difference in what we are doing? And you'll find a lot of the cases you have this like corporate twinning. Everyone's talking the same thing instead of trying to differentiate themselves. So I think there's a, a huge opportunity for people to set a new tone for their organization and, and differentiate themselves and then use social media as a way of, of amplifying that instead of just talking about themselves the whole time. Very good point. Um, so, well, thank you so much, uh, Simon, for joining us on the podcast. My pleasure. Yeah. And uh, thanks, everyone else, for listening in. For more perspectives on the content marketing industry in Europe, check out thecontentmix.com. We'll be releasing more interviews just like this one um, daily on our podcast. So keep listening in. See you next time. <laughs>